<laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tasting Tuesday, a, an hour long kind of chat about all things wine. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's see who is first. Um, just uh, the first one on there, if you can let me know whether I am coming through to you loud and clear. My screen says we're having trouble playing the video. Cindy's there. Hello, Cindy. Uh, do you see me? Can you hear me? Everything's good. Thumbs up. Uh, Marina Hamilton Scott is there. James Belithio. Uh, good evening to you. So who else is there? Paul Carney, fellow wine lovers indeed. Beth Smith, lovely to see you and the family the other day. It's always nice. Susan Swain, um, loud and clear. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Susan Glenn, hello. Marianne Clemente up in Michigan. Hi, Marianne. I hope you and the family are doing well. Send my love to Drennan and the rest of the family. There's Kathy Clifton. Andrea Peters or Andrea Peters rather loud and clear. Thank you so much. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, great. Let's uh, let's give it another sort of minute or two. Um, in the meantime, um, we are talking about Cabernet Franc, and uh, I hope you have your two samples, two glasses, and because it's a comparative tasting, two glasses, hopefully the exact same size. Um, hopefully you've decanted the wines at least an hour. And serving temperature, it's up to you, but slightly chilled because the wine's going to warm up as we as we talk. So, um, welcome. Let's see who else is there before we get going. Um, really, really, really excited. So, Michael France is there. Owen Bryant from Hilton Head. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Hope everything's good there. There's Laura Brown and uh, Margaret Sharon. Hi from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, Buckeye fans, but love you nevertheless. Kevin Norfleet, all the way from St. Croix. Um, I hope you guys are doing all right. Um, hope Drew's doing well. It is Cabernet Franc Day. Absolutely. Um, an exciting varietal. I'm so, so, so excited to, to share these with you. Hopefully, um, those that got them, the, the wines were great and in good uh, condition. Um, let's give it another another minute or two, right? So, Marianne, I hear you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. There's Lynn Pentos. It's wondering where you were. Kimberly Anshell. Uh, Charlie Winfrey, Haley and excited to learn more about our favorite wine. Pressure's on, Charlie. Uh, if this is your favorite wine, you know, the bar said hi, but uh, I have no doubt you're going to love them. I hope, I hope, I hope. There's Erica Johansson from Winchester. Greetings from the Virginia Wine Dogs. Jeff Thorpe, Christopher Pierce, Cabernet Franc. We have an incredible amount of people on you, so let's, uh, let's get going. Um, to my right, I have my, my beautiful wife. And uh, our little son, almost one month, so if he is uh, a little bit chatty, he's excited about Cab Franc too. Who the heck is saying go blue? Jeff Thorpe and obviously Al Schoenberg. Um, just want to point out the, the record uh, between my team, the Ohio State University, and your team, the Michigan Wolverines. I think it's something like 55 to 0 in the last couple. Um, but thanks. There we go. Erica Johansson, go Buckeyes. I appreciate it. So, um Fantastic. Let's jump into it because we don't have a lot of time. So first and foremost, welcome, welcome, welcome. So excited to have you here. Glad that you're here and we appreciate that you're here. We're talking about a varietal that um, I didn't initially like. You know, let's start off like that. I, I wasn't a big fan of Cabernet Franc and uh, I've grown to love it. And I think we're in an area that um, can produce some world-class world-class wines but I think Cabernet Franc is probably the varietal that everyone is excited about the potential of putting Virginia on the map because again we've still got a lot to do a lot to learn um, as always if there's questions shoot away if you don't have a, a Keswick Cabernet Franc in your glass pour yourself a Keswick wine if not Keswick pour yourself a Virginia wine and shoot your questions we'll get to them as we, we can uh, we got a hands full. Unfortunately, we, we want to answer and if we don't get them tonight We will get on tomorrow and or answer all of them So let's talk about Cabernet Franc the varietal that is probably most famous in the Loire region of, of France And why we talk about France is because France is the largest producer of Cabernet Franc in the world and when I think of um, French wine and I, and I think about Cabernet Franc I, I do think about Bordeaux 
obviously in the right bank and the left bank how Cabernet Franc is exclusive not exclusively but it's predominantly a blending grape but in the Loire in the in the regions of Chinon, Bourget and Sumer Champigny it makes these incredibly um, beautifully vibrant perfumey acidic voluptuous round incredible incredible wines um, how did it come to be there? So it was established in the Liberne region um, roughly in the 17th century. In that part of the world, it's known as Brayton. Where does that name come from? That is the name of the abbot who took the cuttings and planted it in the um, at the abbot of uh, or the abbey rather of Bourget. All right, so that's the name. Um, it's planted everywhere in the world, but again, it's it's really. I think still seen as a, as a blending component um, where other than the Loire incredible wines are made obviously there's wines made in Napa Valley in Argentina some of my favorite wines um, but Virginia Virginia is is where I am excited to be making these wines so we're gonna spend some time talking about the grape viticulturally we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about what we can do in the winery to sort of express um, the terroir and when we talk about terroir we're talking about the influences the conditions the climatic the things that are, are are not replicable meaning that you know it's the soil the slope the row orientation the age of the vines uh, the sunshine and the rainfall all of those things that make our vineyard unique all right so we're talking about a red wine but when we talk about Cabernet Franc I use um, or rather we talk about a lot of green and when we talk about green Cabernet Franc, we're talking about what we call MPs. Um, and MPs are methoxypyrazines. And what are they? Because they're very, very, very important in the vineyard, how we manage them in the, in the winery. But what it does is it makes Cabernet Franc taste like a bell pepper. So first question of the day, do you like Cab Franc that smells like vegetables? Do you like Cab Franc that has that inherent Cabernet, um, that, that sort of, bell pepper aroma. I know Cindy Schoenberg does, but how about everyone else? Do you like it? So what are we talking about? We're talking about methoxypyrazine, which is a nitrogen containing heterocyclical compound. And we're talking about two parts of it. We're talking about IPMPs and IBMPs. So isopropyl and isobutyl. And the rough threshold in wine is anywhere from one to six nanograms per liter. And it's a very stable compound. And, and Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon have it but so does Sauvignon Blanc. And when you talk about Sauvignon Blanc and sort of herbaceousness and greenness, it's not so much in a negative kind of way, but when you talk about Cabernet Franc and you go, it smells herbaceous, it smells green, it smells underripe. The problem we have is the sort of the psychological thing about that is that's an underripe grape, it's overcropped and the quality is not so good. Um, you know, so we work very, very, very hard in the vineyard to, to make sure, number one, we reduce the impact of the, the MPs or the methoxypyrazines or pyrazines, if you want to be um, a little bit more, um, you know, kind of spot on. And then what do we do in the vineyard to make sure that when you smell this wine, you get the fruits, you get the spice, you get the violets, you get the dried herbs. Um, because what we want to do is make sure that we have a, a wine that, that communicates the varietal, but really doesn't amplify sort of the greenness. So the first thing we got to know is that it's directly correlated to vegetative growth. Um, and again, we always talk about Virginia being a, a cooler climate region, a region that gets a lot of rainfall in the 40 to 45 inches of uh, rain per year. And in years like 2018, when you have a lot of water and the vines have a lot of access to water, their, their vegetative growth is out of control. And that generally leads to elevated levels of, uh, of sort of these green or these pyrazines, which I'll refer to them from now on. So the first thing we always talk about is our, our soil, right? And, and we've spoken about this um, last week when we spoke about Merlot. Just to recap, these are the soils that we have on the property. They're really well drained. They have very little clay contents. And as you know, clay holds a lot more water than sand and um, and other things. So you can see there's broken shale and there's schist in there. So very, very well drained soils, which I think is is a real sort of key component to, to give yourself the opportunity to grow the best fruit possible. So we are blessed with these well-drained soils. We don't have a lot of slope. We only have about a 12% gradient on there as well. Um, so how does it manifest in the synthesis of these pyrazines takes place between fruit set and roughly two to three weeks before verasion. Now, what is verasion? 
Veraison is when the green grapes, because let me show you a picture. These are the grapes as they are now on the vine. And you can see they're green because they're filled with chlorophyll. But Veraison is at the point at which those green berries um, turn red. You know, they go pink and then they go red and then they become black. So that is Veraison. So the synthesis of these methoxypyrazines happens from about fruit set up until about two to three weeks um, before Veraison. And then as the ripening occurs, they begin to break down faster than the synthesis occurs, right? So part of that is through photodegradation. So exposure to sunlight. So viticulturally, a couple of things. You've got to plant cab franc on the correct site. Secondly, you cannot overcrop it. Cabernet Franc will hold a lot of fruit, but you really don't want to crop it heavily. And then thirdly, you know, amongst other things, you really want to expose the fruit zone to sunlight. You know, and we want to do it early on and we want to expose that fruit to um, sunlight. And when we get to harvest um, and what we think of is 180, gray, 180 days post bud break. Um, and when we're thinking of sort of ripeness, again, you know, a lot of people say, what sugar did you pick it at? What sugar did you pick it at? It's not always correlated to sort of tannin development and flavor development. We sometimes can pick a 24 bricks and the flavors are just dull and not muted. So sugar is one parameter of picking, you know, but a lot of sugar also leads to a lot of alcohol. And again, we're trying to make wines that are balanced, drinkable, age-worthy, vibrant, acidic. Um, so we're looking for moderate alcohol levels. We're not looking for extreme hang time, extreme sugars as well. But at the end of the day, when you've given yourself the chance, and we're talking about 2019 vintage wines today, 19 was an incredible vintage. And, and again, the definition, very simply, an incredible vintage for us is when we can pick the grapes on our terms. We're not dictated to by, you know, wildlife damage or rainfall or, you know, fruit that's rotten or anything like that. But at, at harvest, the highest incidence of methoxypyrazines are in the stems. So why is that important? Well, is because we have to sort the fruit. Um, this is why we sort the fruit. Because those pyrazines are in the, in the stems. And when we run them through the destemmer, we put them on a belt. And we literally pick out all the sort of the green stems. And if we don't, we're going to get them into the wine. Um, we're going to get catechin and epicatechin, which are sort of the bitter compounds. But we're going to get a lot more sort of incidences and opportunity to extract um, these pyrazine sort of characters into the wine. So viticulturally, you know, picking parameters, right site, managing it, controlling the vigor and the vegetative growth. And then when we, we've picked, we've, we sort very, very heavily, which I think with Cabernet Franc, is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. The other thing is, you know, research has suggested that there are more pyrazines in basal leaves, the, the really old leaves at the bottom of the stem, and in laterals. Now, a lateral shoot is a shoot that grows between the shoot and a leaf. Those lateral shoots have a lot. So, again, when we pull and we're trying to pull out the basal leaves, we're trying to pull out a lot of laterals. Um, the other thing that really sort of impacts us is the infestation of ladybugs. Why is that important? Because if ladybugs get into the fermenter or into the crusher, we're going to extract hemolyph. And what is hemolyph? Hemolyph is the, um, is the equivalent to blood in, in an insect. So we want to make sure that we don't have an infestation, an infestation of bugs, right? So you need mother nature to be cooperative. You need to be able to hang the fruit to get those sort of flavor developments and the seed developments and the tannin developments. You got to make sure that your canopy management is done correctly. Your cropping levels are adequate. You don't want to be under crop where you're only getting like 25 cases a, a, an acre. That's obviously not practical, but you don't want to overcrop it where the vine cannot fully ripen that fruit. You want to make sure that your, your fruit zone is open to sunlight, but not too much because you don't want to burn the fruit. And then obviously you want to pick the fruit in a healthy condition, devoid of any insect damage, or in this case, ladybug, and it's called ladybug taint. So, you know, fun fact for the day, hemolyph, which is the fluid in the, in the, in the bug itself, which is uh, what, what the equivalent of blood is, that can go in and that can be a source of greenness in the, um, in the fruit. All right, so what are we, what are we talking about? So you, if you get a lot of, you know, pyrazine characters in the wine, generally how it's manifested is a lack of color, a lack of ripeness, and the overall quality from a consumer point of view for the most part, for the most part, some people really love that green character, but for the most part, uh, people are put off by the very sort of herbaceous bell pepper character of, of the wine. So a couple of things we do in the winery. There are no significant 
um, pyrazine, you know, differences in press fractions. There has been sort of data to suggest, but newer research has shown that sort of free run, lightly pressed and heavy pressed really sort of manifest the same levels of these pyrazine characters in wine. How do you do it in, in whites? Uh, settling. Um, if we have, and, and sometimes like with our V squared, we really want to make sort of a green, a thiolytic, a herbaceous wine. So we're actually trying to sort of amplify, you know, the pyrazinic character in, in certain varietals. But if you're trying to reduce it in white wines, settling through an aid of a pectolytic enzyme. And an enzyme, as you know, is a catalyst that speeds up a reaction. But it is thought that the, the pyrazinic characters actually bind with the grape solids. And that's why we settle. So when we press, we get this really sort of dirty juice, goes into the tank, we turn the chilling on, we use pectolytic enzyme, which is an uh, enzyme breaks down pectin and it speeds up the reaction and the settling thereof. And it's thought those, those pyrazines actually settle to the bottom of the vessel, leaving juice that is actually minimized. And you can actually reduce the pyrazinic character about 50%. In terms of fermentation, you know, and again, fermentation very simply is sugar in the form of glucose and fructose turning into alcohol. And what that happens is because we're fermenting on the skins, the carbon dioxide is one of the byproducts that actually pushes the skins to the top. And we talk a lot about sort of pumping over. Um, I was trying to find, let's see, um, I can't pull that up for some other reason. Um, never mind. I was trying to pull up a, uh, a photo of a pump over. But there's really, again, no differences between the timing, the pump over, the punch down, or rotation tanks, whatever it is, right? So the only real thing that is shown to work is something called thermovinification. And that's actually what that means is it's a pre-ferment heating up of the must. And why that uh, kind of reduces sort of greenness in, um, in sort of the wine is that the, the pyrazines are actually volatile above 50 degrees centigrade. Um, so again, if you have greenness and flash detente, but if you really cook your must, uh, you can actually, you know, kind of reduce the sort of the, the incidence of those the pyrazinic characters. The other way you do it, if you, if you haven't done a good job and the wine goes into a barrel, you can always mask it. And masking is really things we do not want to do. And what I mean by masking is you put it in brand new barrels. You taste the cab franc, you taste a barrel. You smell the cab franc, you smell a barrel. What does it do? It mutes sort of the green characters of the wine, but I think that is a, a shame to do because Cabernet Franc uh, does not taste like oak and it shouldn't. If you've done a good job in the vineyard, and I think Cabernet Franc really demands you to do a good job in the vineyard. If you've had a good growing season, um, you know, what we want to do philosophically is express in that glass of wine how the grape was grown. And for us, that means backing off on the oak. Again, both of these wines, um, the, the reserve has seen a little bit more newer barrel, you know, but it's a second and third year barrel versus a fourth and a fifth year barrel for the, for the Cabernet Franc. There's no new oak on this wine as well. Why? Because we felt, you know, we had a great growing season. We were picking at physiological ripeness. In sugars, that's 24.5. pHs is around 3.65, 3.7. You know, tannins were there. Um, you know, what I love about Cabernet Franc, from last week's Merlot, the tannins are really soft and supple and silky. These are a little bit bigger and a little bit more sort of, you know, in your face, but certainly not like the uh, the Cab Sav that we're going to try next week. But it's also got brightness. It's got freshness. It's got acidity, which I really, 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 really love this app. So again, if we do a good job in the vineyard, we, we do a very good job in the winery where we don't over extract. We sort of kind of reduce sort of the pyrazinic characters through the, the manner in which we can. What you could end up is with incredible wines incredible wines that I think Virginia um, produces. And honestly, I think Virginia produces some of the finest versions of Cabernet Franc in, in the world, you know? So agree or disagree, that's my opinion. I really think Virginia makes some of the, the best versions, expressions of Cabernet Franc in the world. Let me know if you, if you think so too. So um, broad spectrum, what are, we, what are we talking about with Cab Franc? Um, sort of aromas, uh, and flavors and weight and texture and density and uh, and then so let's jump into it so again as the search suggests it's a uh, pori pour sniffy sniff drinky drink swirly swirl so let's get into it so i hope you have your glasses i hope they've been decanted so when we talk about cabernet franc we're, we're literally thinking about sort of currants um herbaceous graphite pencil lead violets spices black pepper uh, which comes from a, a compound called rotundone, which is a, a sesquiterpene, 
um, which is an interesting thing. Uh, black pepper you find a lot in the Northern Rhone. Uh, Syrah is one that really expresses that, but I, I find you can get that in Cabernet Franc as well. So let's let's go back and forth um, because these are comparative tastings. So I am going to start with the um, the regular, and again. The difference between the two are, are young vine versus older vine. Um, older vines a little bit more balanced, a little bit more sort of balanced in terms of sort of vegetative growth. The canopy is a little bit more even. The vines really need time. And once they, they have that time and they develop, they sort of regulate and balance themselves naturally. The younger vines, we're all excited about the potential this fruit will give us down the line, but it's going to take time for us to get there. We have five very, very special blocks of Cabernet Franc on the property planted on what I think is, is sort of some of the prime real estate, right? Um, so it's not, they're different. It's not one's better than the other, um, but I think the fruit that is now designated as the, the Cabernet Franc um, will in time go into higher end bottlings. You know, it might be our signature series, it might be the reserve, or it might be the block designate. So let's jump into it. So the first thing, just to move that out of the way, um, you can see we're not lacking color. Now again, it's it's more sort of garnet, and with the Merlot, the, the edges tended to be a little bit more sort of brick red and orange. I think this is a little bit more uniform through the glass. Um, you know, it's, it's beautifully extracted, but it's not purple, it's more in that sort of garnet color. And then again, if you, if you swirl it, you can see the tears or the legs of the wine, you know, it's sort of medium plus in density. Um, this is a dry wine. It's got 0.1% residual sugar, which is one gram per liter. The alcohol is moderate. It's 14. It's not 14.5 or 15, which puts it in the higher levels of wine. Um, but the visual is just one thing, right? And uh, there's Mr. Alakai. He's, he's got a lot to say. So let's, let's smell. And again, what we do is we swirl the glasses around. And what we're doing, we're volatilizing the esters. And the esters are the interaction between carboxylic acids and alcohols. Volatility, by definition, means the ability to vaporize, right? So the shape of the glass, I've chosen a, a sort of a taller glass, narrow at the top there as well. So um, cheers. God bless. Let's see what we get, right? So, you know, sort of first, sort of off the bat, um, I get this really lovely dried, herbaceous, dried rose petal um, kind of character, you know, kind of where you, where you pick flowers and you dry them, almost that sort of potpourri kind of nose, which is really, really, really interesting. Um, these wines have been decanted for about an hour and a half, and, and they probably require a little bit more time, all right? So, and then again, um, with all our wines, I get that sort of violet kind of character on, on sort of the back end, you know, that secondary uh, secondary aroma that comes through. So again, I get these really lovely sort of herbaceous notes. And when I think of um, Cabernet Franc, I always think sort of uh, oregano, oregano, um, you know, sage and thyme, that sort of things, all the Provencal herbs. But it's really sort of dried herbs and dried flowers and sort of dried fruits. Um, really, really interesting kind of nose, beautifully aromatic. And then violets, and then perhaps maybe a little bit sort of the, the darker pencil lead graphite that comes through as well. A little bit of black tea. I don't get a lot of sort of um, inherent mocha or, or sort of flavors that I would say are derived from the barrel itself, but beautifully expressive, very sort of savory, and you know, it just makes you want to dive in and, and drink the damn wine. So, so let's do exactly that. So, cheers. All right. Again, first impression. It's got great acidity. Um, you know, it's quite fresh and vibrant and lively, which is what you want. Uh, you know, we're not talking about massively structured, full-bodied wines. And again, last week we spoke about how we're, we're trying to make wines a little bit more with restraint, a little bit more with balance. So I would say this is medium to medium plus to full-bodied, but it's not a, a massively structured um, kind of wine. But I really love the acidity. I really love sort of the entry and the attack onto the palate as well. Um, and then the transition from the mid to the to the back palate, um, it's there and it sort of stays in your mouth. But again, when I, I think of the finish, you don't want sort of wines that are, are coarse and astringent and bitter and chalky. You really want this dryness, but you really want sort of supple um, sort of tannins. And, and I think we've got that. And I think that's really just a product of an incredible vintage and an incredible sight. So, but that's just the first impression. And these wines are gonna change. Um, so let's jump back in and give it a second taste.
Yeah, I love the vibrancy and how fresh and light it is on the on the front. Um, but it's got some weight, it's got some texture, but I really think the wines are balanced. And again, when we talk about balance, we're talking about harmonious, you know, composition of the parts, the alcohol and the fruit and the acid and the tannin. And um, these wines are in tank, they've been assembled. The barrels have all been third and fourth year barrels, small bariques. And again, if you look behind me, the bariques are the smaller barrels on the top there versus the punch and style barrels, which are the 500 liter, which is the reserve. So talking about the reserve, let's jump into that. Um, again, is it noticeably Cab Franc? If it is, how does it differ? So um, if you look at it side by side, you know, color wise, and if you hold the wines at a sort of slight angle against a white background, you know, you could really, really see a, a subtle difference. And I really think the, the reserve is a touch darker. You know, it, it has a little bit more sort of denseness to it, a little bit darker throughout the wine as well, which is which is great to see. Um, very different. Uh, doesn't have sort of that uh, lovely herbaceousness and potpourri. This is this is really more on the on the spicy spectrum. You know, um, really sort of African spices. You know, black pepper. But the one thing I don't get, and thank God, is greenness. I don't get any sort of vegetal, stemmy herbaceous character thank the pope thank the lord thank my vineyard staff because they do an incredible job growing this fruit so i really love the fact first and foremost there's no greenness there's no inherent greenness but i think the varietal character comes through it has that spice it has that lovely herbaceousness but in a good way not in an underripe way we get a lot of sort of black tea on this wine again you know the the black pepper i think comes through you know the graphite you know, the minerality almost, you know, um, that sort of slatiness almost in a way. Maybe some dark chocolate or sort of bitter chocolate on the notes there as well. But again, the reserve wines tend to be a little bit tighter, not aromatically as expressive, because the one sort of distinction between the wines, I would say right now, just aromatically is, this wine is going to take time, the reserve is going to take time, it's going to evolve. You know, both of these wines require time. They're going to be drinkable, they're going to be accessible, they're going to provide enjoyment, but if you really, really want to get what Keswick Cabernet Franc is all about, you want to drink these wines three, five, six, seven years down the line as well. So again, you know, really, really intriguing, aromatic, um, beautifully expressive, I think variety correct, no greenness, thank goodness for me. Um, let's taste it. This is big. It's big. Probably doesn't have quite the level of acidity that the Cabernet Franc does, which is fine. It's got acid, but the tannins, mm, these are voluptuous. These are big, you know, really round tannins, but they're there. Just feels chewy, but chewy in a good way. And what does that mean? Um, just that it needs time. It's time. It's a young wine. We bottled this in August. Um, we've also got a couple of block designates coming your way, but I think this is just going to take time. It's going to become phenomenal. Um, I love them right now. They are different. And again, the soil composition is very similar. The, the row orientation is 90 degrees. Um, the older vine is east-west. The younger vines are north-south. Uh, that's just really important in terms of how the sun rises. Obviously, it rises in the east, which is the warmer side in the morning. Um, as it goes over the rise and in the west, that's the really hotter part of the day. So when you pull leaves, we pull very heavily on the east side. We pull less heavily on the, uh, on the west side, north-south. So canopy management's a little bit different. Two different clones, two different rootstocks. Uh, the reserve is actually planted around 808 vines an acre. Um, the young vines are planted a little bit more densely, um, around 1,400 vines an acre. And again, the reason that is really important and exciting is that every, every vine can carry less fruit. Um, again, we're not grape growers. We always say we're not in the grape growing business. We're in the wine growing business. We want to grow the kind of fruit that allows us to make the kind of wines that um, we have. So let's just jump um, back and forth again. I hope you're enjoying these wines. Um, and then I'll flip over. I do apologize. My wife took Alakai out. He was uh, a little bit fussy. And um, I'll jump through and see if there's any questions that we can answer. So bear with me. So definitely, um, I love sort of the dried kind of character that comes through. The dried flowers, the potpourri, the herbaceousness. Really intriguing. And that's the entry level um, Cabernet Franc. I think it's wonderful. Uh, it's beautiful. It's expressive. It's floral. Um, it's, it's a weird sort of term for reds. But you get this really lovely floral kind of character, the violets especially, that comes out. Which I, I always think violets is more like an earthier component than anything else. So, 
yeah, very light and vibrant and zingy, and it's serious, and um, it's a wine you can drink, and it, it's definitely going to be a great sort of food pairing wine. And then the reserve wine, yeah, a little quieter of the two, maybe not a showboaty, very serious, you know, the philosophical kind of type, you know, the one that you got to pick their brain and they got so much to share with you, but you got to kind of break them down a little bit. This one's going to be your friend immediately. This one needs to warm up to you, put it that way, all right? Definitely a lot going on with both of these wines. Um, I hope you love them. I enjoy them. And uh, let me let me kind of flip over and answer some questions. But first, if I may, I want to give a shout out to, to two very special ladies. Firstly, um, and they're misses to me, because I, I went to school uh, with uh, Dean and Sean. So Mrs. Albra in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. I hope you're doing well. Uh, send my love to you and your family. I hope everyone's safe. And then to Mrs. Woodman in Queensland, Australia. And uh, I believe it was Trevor, Roberts, and Sean. It's been a while since I've seen them. But um, if you are watching, and uh, you were watching last week, I just wanted to say hello. Thank you. God bless. I hope you're safe. And uh, send my best to, to everybody over there. So um, let me flip it over here. And um, let, me, let me see. Um, all right. So first question is uh, the yeast. Both of these wines are actually fermented um, with um, with yeast, commercial strains of yeast, yeast that are designed to ferment, you know, at a at a certain temperature that require uh, less food. And when we talk about food, um, you know, um, we're we're talking about nitrogen levels. So both of these wines are fermented now. When we're talking about um, you know wines where we want to sort of express the microflora, we do a lot of sort of ambient fermentations where we don't add yeast. Um, but with these, we decided to to sort of add a commercial yeast to control it a little bit. But with our block designated wines, um, we're we're talking about ambient fermentation. So really, really exciting, really question. So Frank Morgan, uh, question in the intro. You spoke about Cabernet Francs from the Loire which is my favorite region outside of Virginia, of course. Is there a producer you believe is the, uh, the Cab Franc benchmark? Um, that's a great question. Um, Clos Rougeau is, is definitely one of my favorites. I think the Raffo wines in the Loire are, are incredible. I think price point to quality. Um, Famille de Vaux, I, I, I think, is one. But what I really like is Chateau de Villeneuve. Um, but I, I love that region. I love the restraint. I love the sort of the the character of the wines as well. Um, and Chateau Yvonne would be one. Outside of Chinon and outside of Virginia, um, I love a, a winery called El Enemigo in uh, Mendoza in Argentina. There's a winery in Australia that I think makes incredible Cabernet Franc called Kelly Brook. And then if you think of Napa Valley, um, the one that really, really stands out to me that I really enjoy is La Jota. Uh, J O T T A, which I might have, um, I might be mispronouncing that, but Dariush and Dao, but Lahota is is an incredible, incredible sort of varietal. So I hope that um, I hope that answers answers your question. But yeah, the that, the Rafo, and I'm just looking at Clojure, um I I agree 100% with you. But uh, Famille de Vaux and Chateau Yvonne are, are two that I really really enjoy. So. Thank you to that, Frank. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you spending some time with us. Dennis Sugamelli, good evening to you. And Marsha, what was your barrel program for the Cab Franc 2014 Reserve? Um, going back a few years now, Cabernet Franc Reserve, uh, one of my favorite, favorite wines. Purely, uh, I think, number one, it, it, it was our Governor's Cup winning wine, which I really, really love. Um, I, I've still got a few bottles. I think as good as it was then, it's, it's really coming into its own. But with Cabernet Franc, we, we don't use new oak whatsoever. It's always based on the vintage. 14 was a wonderful vintage. So it was two and three year barriques. So the same size as the Cabernet Franc is in, but it's the same age that the reserve wine is in as well. Um, 10 months in barrel, where the reserve will spend 10 months in barrel and the, um, the regular was, was nine months. But uh, great, great question. Um, let's see. Pamela Jane says, totally agree with me about Virginia Cab Franc. Um, I agree. Thank you so much. You know, drink Virginia wines first and foremost. And uh, I think Cabernet Franc is, is a varietal that Virginia does incredibly well. Neil Glazer, black pepper is what I look for. That Rotundone, Rotundone God, R-O-T-U-N-D-O-N-E. Come on, Stephen. Neil Glazer, thank you so much. Hope you're doing well. Yes, I love the sort of the spicier, peppery, 
Uh, rotundum is the chemical compound in peppercorns, which is what Syrah has or Shiraz. Um, but I love sort of the black pepper, the white pepper, the spiciness, the Indian spices, the, the spices from Morocco and Tunisia, the North American spices. The spice I don't like, again, is the, is the bell pepper. Bell pepper. Um, Frank has another question. Let's answer it, sir. Vine age. You know, at what age do Cabernet Franc wines really start to offer the best fruit complexity? And at what age does diminishing returns kick in? Um, hmm. It's a great question. Uh, I would say that I haven't worked with a lot of old vine Cabernet Franc. So our, our reserve wine that you're drinking tonight comes from a block planted in 2000. So that has been in the ground for 20 years now. That I would say is, is a wine that shows maturity and there's balance, there's elegance. Um, it's not a prolific producer. We're only producing around two, two and a half tons an acre. The, the younger vine, you know, so how long will it sustain that? Um, you know, will we, we have to interplant or will we have to pull some vines out? But I think it, it really needs 10 to 15 years to get there, Frank, to be honest with you. I've watched that block. I think the wines that we made early on in the, in the life of that vine were, were really lovely, but they were a little imbalanced. They were maybe a bit too dark, a bit more tannic, you know, not enough acidity, slightly imbalanced. I really love how these wines have sort of evolved into something elegant and balanced, age-worthy, but structured, drinkable, you know, food-friendly, but you can have it on its own. So I would say 10 to 15 years, I think that really requires a, you know, that time for the vine to be balanced. In terms of longevity of the vineyard, I hope to be working with these vineyards for the next 20 to 25 years. Um, but obviously there is a practical, uh, practical implication of if we're only producing half a ton an acre, we're either charging $150 a bottle or we have to really rethink it. But I, I hope old vines, mature vines are precious. And uh, I think we've planted the, the correct varietal and the correct part of the, of the estate. I'm excited about the, the wines that are coming out in the next couple of years. But great, great, great question. Uh, let's see, Mimi uh, Popo jumping in a bit late. Better late than never. It's great to see you. Uh, Brian said welcome and welcome to Brian too. Um, let's see what else is there as well. Second taste is those. The rest of had a glass. Does, does this bottle now stay in barrel? How do you decide? It's a question from Suzanne Barber. Um, it's a great question. You know, I, I think the first thing we, we've got to know is there is a, a practical side to winemaking. Obviously, we want to make sure that the wine club gets the wines, that there's wines in the tasting room. I also really, really think that, you know, more time in the barrel just, you know, might help to a certain extent. But this wine is so fresh and vibrant, which is what we want to do. We actually want to make a wine that sort of communicates where it's grown and how it was grown and the strength of the vintage. We certainly don't want to leave it in, in a barrel as long, you know, to the point where the barrel sort of dominates the wine as well. So a lot of it is, is there's the practical side of it. The other part is just tasting, tasting, tasting and sensorial because we always have the option, Suzanne, to take it out of one barrel and put it in another or take it out of a barrel and age it in a tank. So a lot of it is, is sort of the practical side of it, the business and the, and the needs of the tasting room and the wine club. Obviously, we want to make the best wine possible. Um, and what's exciting is, you know, this year we're, we're making four or five Cabernet Francs. You know, these are just the first two. We have the Block Designate, the Block 7 and the Block 2 which are exclusive wine club wines. And then we have the signature series as well. And those are wines that we can really push the envelope a little bit, age them for an additional year. But then we say to you, these are wines that really require time in the bottle. You know, if you buy those block designated wines and the signature series wines, you really, 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 really are not doing yourself a disservice because you can drink these wines and get great pleasure from it, which is the point. But I think if you really want to get complexity and sort of intriguing aromas and flavors that just explode in your mouth and balance, you know, our Cab Francs really five to seven to eight to 10 years really, really, really come into their own. Um, you know, so Terry says, the moment I opened it, I fell in love with the nose of the reserve. Um, that's great. I, I love it. I love it because at the end of the day, what, what it does is your palate just confirms everything you've thought about the wine. Again, you know, you look at the wine, you look at the reserve and you go, that's got color. That's deep. That's rich. This is a serious wine. But if you smell it and it smells like, I don't know, ethyl acetate or vinegar or Britannomyces, which is that barnyard, depending on if it's uh, ethyl phenol, ethyl guicol, um, you know, the nose has really got to get you salivating. You know, it's when you're in a restaurant and you, and you can smell the, the, uh, the aromas of the food being cooked and you just can't wait to get it. That's what we want from the aroma of the wine. And I agree, it's, 
it's intoxicating you know it makes you want to dive into that glass and um you know but the the kind of the regular you know the entry level just i think punches above its weight class i think as well but i love it let it breathe for three hours absolutely living up to its promise i'm excited to hear that you know i'm so full of crap because i love these wines and it's always lovely to hear that um that you do too so um terry thank you so much now al says i can drink them now and again you know you should be able to drink the wines now there's nothing worse than buying a wine and being told that you cannot should not and better not drink it for the next five years. You know, we want to make wines that are drinkable, but age-worthy, age-worthy, but drinkable as well. But um, absolutely, I'm sure I'm sure a couple of cases are going to come from the winery into, into that cellar. How long will you age both of the Cab Francs? And that's a question from Dennis. Um, age it in terms of before we bottle it or age it prior to, to releasing? Let me answer it because I'm not 100% sure of, of what you were thinking. Um, the, the Cabernet Franc has has been taken out of bottle it's in the barrel homogenizing we bottle that uh july 31st the reserve comes out about two three weeks after that and gets bottled august 20th and then our block designated wines um we we still haven't decided we might bottle them and we might let them sit and then our signature series wines will definitely 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 sit in barrel for another year let's see frank morgan on winery and vineyard teams winemakers tend to get most of the attention and credit and for good reason, but wine is a team sport. Um, would like to hear more about your team. I would love to talk about my team. Um, winemakers get way too much credit, um, way too much of the accolades, because at the end of the day, your wine is an expression of where it was grown, how it was grown. And there's a lot of work, Frank, as you know, that goes into to growing it. So I have a wonderful crew. Right now, I've got Manuel, Rebecca, Delfino, um, Gerardo, and I've got Lewis. Um, folks that are, are sort of committed to producing wines, I'm, I'm tough to work with. I'm a pain in the ass. My, my sort of quality expectations are right up there. And um, they're aligned philosophically. They do the work. And again, I would say all the credit, not some of the credit, all the credit should go to the vineyard team. Um, at the end of the day, when you have harvests like 18 and the fruit, through no fault of anybody else's, comes in underripe and under green, the best winemakers are going to make the best wines. But in years like 17, 14, 10, and 19, I think, you know, a winemaker's dream is to, is to get the, the best fruit on the, on the crush pad. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily involved in the vineyard, but I take no credit for the wines. You know, they have done and deserve. Um, I wish they were, were tasting the wines with us because they can be very, very proud of the wines they created. Um, and then we get back to work. We celebrate that fact and then we get back to work and uh, we improve upon that. Because as we say, Frank, these wines are better than last year, but they're never as good as the next. So again, you know, um, I make mention of our team a lot. It is a team effort from a production point of view. All the credit should go to the, uh, should go to the vineyard team. So Frank, thank you for pointing that out. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Melissa Oliver says, are the shirts still for sale? I'm not 100% sure, Melissa, but I will, I will ask and I will post that tomorrow. Uh, Chris Schoenberg, if you're on the, um, on the thing tonight, good evening. I hope you're doing well, by the way. Love you. And uh, if, um, if those shirts are available, would you reply to Melissa Oliver and let her know if she can get it and if she can, how you can get it as well. So um, let's see. Laura Purdy says the reserve is much more fruit forward. Lots of blueberry and cherry. And um, okay, so lovely. I mean, still wonderful, wonderful descriptors. I can get that. I can get that. But you get these really sort of dusty, sort of pencil lead shavings, you know, kind of sawdusty kind of stuff, which is really, 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 really cool. So um, Chris uh, said the unfortunately the the shirts are are closed. So I, I do apologize. Uh, let me see. Um, again, you know, my wife is taking care of the little one, so I apologize. Uh, when will the reserve be ready to bottle, Kathy Clifton? The reserve gets bottled August twentieth, Kathy. And again, we want to talk about, if you stick with me for a couple more minutes, we're going to tell you about some really cool promotions that are coming up and how you can get these wines before anybody else. Um, so while I'm sort of going through, uh, let's see, um, Michael France, how's the extreme heat impacting the grapes? It's a great question. The, the, the heat is, is pretty, pretty severe at the moment. I mean, we've had 23 days now, consecutive days over 19, and hadn't had a drop of rain, which is really, really tough. So the, the one thing is we, we've had plenty of rain um, pre-season. 
you know, there's enough natural groundwater in there. And what it's doing is it's driving those roots deep down. So I walked through the vineyard this afternoon. Um, I'm not seeing any signs of heat stress. And what I mean by that is if you, you hold the leaf, the leaf is warm because it's not transpirating because the stomata closes, you know, generally the leaves will turn away from the sun. I'm not seeing that. So I think because of the age, because we don't have, if we had vines that we planted three or four months ago, uh, we'd be we'd be hurting a little bit. But so far, so good. We could use a little bit of rain just to sort of get things going again. Um, we want to make sure that the, the vines are healthy and they don't stop photosynthesizing as we get to Verasion, uh, which will happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, but so far, so good. We've, we've been riding it out, but um, you know, we're, we're worried. We need a little bit of water, so, so thanks for that. Um, how would you rate your Cabernet Franc by year? Wow, Susan Swain, great question. Um, it's hard because I really think these 19s and 17s are some of the best that we've made, but it's hard to compare a young Cabernet Franc to a, a 14 or a 10 or a 9 that has had the, the ability to age and has developed all the sort of secondary and tertiary characters. So I would say my, my favorite vintages, 7, 9, 10, 14, 16, 17, 19. That would be it. Um, I really, really believe the wines have evolved. The, the wines that we're making now, I think, are better than the wines we made then. That's because of two reasons. I think, number one, the vineyard has, has matured and there's balance. The other thing that's matured is me, the winemaker. You know, I've really had to learn about Cab Franc. I've had to learn about growing Cab Franc in Virginia on our property. Um, but I really, really love, you know, the sort of the 10, the 14, 16, 17, and the 19. And I hope... I hope that next year when we talk about wines, we're going to be talking about the 20 and how incredible that is. Um, so let me scroll through and get more sort of uh, questions, but let me tell you how you can get these wines. So we're talking about futures and uh, here's the offer. If uh, you're a gold member, wine club member, you're going to get 30% off these wines. Now, this offer is valid until midnight on Monday. And again, the, the reserve Cab Franc is $39.95. The regular Cab Franc is uh, $34.95 and 30% off takes it to under $25 a bottle. But as they always say, that's not all. If you buy uh, three bottles, you're just going to get flat shipping for 10 bucks. And if you buy six, we're going to take care of the shipping for you anywhere where you are. If you buy six or more bottles and it doesn't have to be six of the reserve or six of, you can bundle it. You can do four, two, three, three, four. Five, one, um, free shipping on six bottles or more. But futures again, 30% if you're a gold member, 25% if you're a silver wine club member, and if you're not a member, you're going to get 10%. And that is just 5% over and above your normal, normal kind of. Um, <gasps> you have no clothes. Um, so yeah, take advantage. It's on the web page. It's www.keswickvineyards.com. Um, I know some people had some issue getting on last year. It is the featured wines on the main page. If not, give our staff a call. We'd be happy to help you. 434-244-3341, extension 105. I've got my beautiful daughter sitting next to me, but you don't have a shirt on, so you can't come on. But say hi. Just say hi. 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 All right. Um, again, so let me see what else we got going on over here. Um, Frank is killing it tonight with the questions. Are you going to do any more Zoom hangouts? Loved a few months back. Frank is phenomenal, and uh, I didn't I didn't think he would ask me for sort of examples from the uh, the Loire, but uh, you know he he certainly really really is uh, is phenomenal. He does a great job. Check out his blog. Drink what you like, and uh, I think he did a, a wonderful piece on Virginia Cab Francs not so long ago. So Frank, if you can uh, send that link, I think it's a, a wonderful read for everyone. Um, that's really really. Um, excited about this wine as well. So let's see. Erica Johansson says, are these both grown at Keswick? You note the 20 year vines for the reserve. Yes, they are 100% estate grown, estate managed, estate bottled, estate grown and estate loved. Um, you know, our first vineyards were planted in the year 2000, which is the fruit from the reserve. The, um, the younger vines uh, was planted in 2016. So we're looking at, it's a youngster. Um, and then we've got other blocks that we planted in 17 and 18. So the best fruits are still to come. Jeff says, any plans on new plantings? Um, I think 
if we, Jeff, could get quality like this year in, year out, we would love to have more of, of the Merlot and the Cab Franc and the Cab Sav. But right now, we're at about 70 acres. And I think, you know, what we got to do is just take a breath, you know, manage those really, really well, learn about the, the fruit and where they come from. Um, but we have land and we have incredible land that we can plant on. Um, so don't say never, but I think for the, for the immediate future, we're, we're not going to do many, many more sort of expansions over there as well. Um, let's see. Production is key. It's a business after all relating to aging vines. Uh, yeah, Neil, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we have to, we have to make sure that we, we're not producing small lots and we're hanging on to blocks just because of our emotional attachment to them. They have to be sort of, you know, they have to produce, but there's a balance between production and quality. At the end of the day, you know, the way forward is through quality. You know, again, you know, we always say we make wines, you know, that can rival any Virginia wines. No, Virginia is saying we can make wines that can rival anything in the world. And that has always got to be the mantra. So, but you're 100% key. Production is key. And for us, our site is not a, a heavily cropping site, you know, and that's because of our really weak soils. Um, but what it means, hopefully, and this is just me bragging and, and again, touting sort of all the work of the vineyard guys, is that, um, you know, those lower cropping levels and those really sort of extreme sites that we've got that fruit planted on is making these killer, 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 killer wines. So, um, Adam Rockhill says you weren't kidding about 2019. Uh, Adam, 2019, just a phenomenal, phenomenal year, top to bottom. Whites, reds, uh, fruit forward wines, age worthy wines. Really, 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 really excited. Um, and Kevin says maybe in five years we can do a 2019 Cab Franc tasting. That would be incredible. So what that means, folks, is you've got to buy more than one. And we should all make a pact that we're going to put one of each of these wines away and we'll meet back here in five years' time and uh, we'll play the video and then jump in and try all these wines again. So it's a great sort of... Um, it's, it's, it's a great sort of idea. I'm just laughing because Al Schoenberg says my glass smells like Barnard. Not barnyard. I'll take that because barnyard is sweet. He's fruity. He's voluptuous. He's age worthy, and uh, you know nothing wrong with that. Um, Janice says, "How long have these been in the barrel?" Sorry, you've already said it's not a problem. I appreciate the question. Um, the the reserve will have been in barrel for ten months when we take it out. The regular cab franc would have been in barrel for nine months, but it has come out of the barrel. It's getting ready to to be bottled in uh, in well in two weeks time. So July July thirtieth. Um, I age Keswick's Cab Franc, Diane Norton Thomas. Oh my God. Um, what a sweet person. Diane, hope you and Scott are doing well. And, uh, she says she's aged Keswick Cab Francs for over a decade and love doing my vertical tasting of Cab Franc. That's great to know. We, we really do think these wines are, are structurally sound and hopefully well made that they could last 10, 15 years in the bottle under correct cellar facilities and conditions. But we also want to make sure that you know, you, you drink the wines and you get absolutely pleasure and enjoyment from it as well. And uh, the more we make it and the more we sort of research our older wines of their age, we'll be able to to let you know, let you know. Um, so uh, Dave says, first time I actually get the graphite, you know. So yeah, graphite is, is one and pencil lead is something I get a lot. But I get that really on the reserve. I really don't get that on the, um, on the sort of the entry level cap franc. I still get sort of the dried fruits and that dried sort of flowers and stuff like that. But it's really, really interesting as well. Um, phew, gosh, there's so many comments, so many questions. I know we're coming up to 7.53. So um, let me see. Um, Brian says, now it's my favorite rice on 2019 does not point. He's going to be up with the 14. I've always known you, you've loved Cabernet Franc, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. The 14 is obviously a very special wine to us, Brian. I think these 19s could be every bit as good. And then I'm also really, really excited about the Wine Club exclusive, you know, Block 7 and the Block 2. So if you've not joined the Wine Club, there's two reasons to join the Wine Club right there and then. These are wines that we're making only for you, for you to enjoy. It's our experimental, really, really sort of upper level, you know, quality kind of wines. So, um, but I appreciate that, Brian. How are the vineyards doing um, that were damaged in the spring, asks Mimi Popo. Um, you know, by, by the looks of it, the vineyards are doing great. You know, they're green, they're luscious, they're growing, they're vegetative. There's just, uh, in certain parts of the vineyard, there's no fruit. And, um, and that's just the, the sad fact of, of what we went through. You know, we had eight days where we had sort of um, close to sub-zero temperatures. 
and and we got a bit clattered but there's fruits out there mimi and while we're not making as much wine this year as we have done in the past we're still very 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 hopeful that the quality will be through the roof um so really really excited uh let's see um adam says i prefer virginia cab franc but a bit chilean carmineri is similar if you like uh, the franc give it a try if you come across one absolutely carmineri is uh, again it's a bordeaux varietal uh great comments adam um absolutely i think you you should try it it's a phenomenal phenomenal wine uh let's see um sorry you're saying can we still order the merlot futures too um charlie i tell you what what i would do is give the tasting room a call i know that the offer expired at midnight last night but we certainly do not want to deny you the opportunity to get that wonderful merlot so give us a call tomorrow in the tasting room we're open after 10 a.m 434-244-3341 extension 105 i believe sarah is the manager on duty tomorrow and we will honor the the merlot futures for you so give us a call and we'll take care of you all right um gosh that's about it i found that virginia cab franc tends to sing at six to seven of the age what do others think great question frank uh question from frank what do you folks think about the sort of the sweet spots of drinking wines do you buy wines to age or do you buy wines to drink and uh how many of you have have wines that are older five years that are cab franc but i agree frank 100 percent six to seven years um from from very good producers from very good vineyards and very good vintages those wines are absolutely phenomenal um let's see again you know hmm. um lots of questions i'm not uh, i'm not getting to all of them so we're, we're gonna finish up i know there have been some requests to see the little guy so we're, we'll oblige and then if you don't mind we'll go through the wines one more time but um you know he's he's been a little bit of a chatterbox but here's uh the big boy three and a half weeks old and 10 pounds with the biggest brightest eyes you'll ever meet inquisitive chatty full of character um you know doing great so if you haven't met him before this is mr alakai reese barnard who um is doing wonderfully well and again for everyone that's reached out and said hello and sent their best wishes we we so gratefully um appreciate it and uh this is the hiccups in the background and and sort of the chatterbox so uh he can't say hi just yet but um, i'm sure he's going to greet you at the tasting room one day and he's going to be in the vineyards and the winery before you know it making incredible wines all right so mwah. all right so again if i may just to go through the wines um the cabernet franc which i love i think it's 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 classic it's it's vibrant it's fruit forward um again that sort of dried character i just can't get away from you know um beautifully light and graceful on its feet it's got tannins but the acidity comes through beautifully the reserve my god the reserve is is such a beautiful wine but a wine that i am just sort of itching to to kind of fast forward and, and drink this in sort of five years time um and i really really think that while the cabernet franc is is approachable and drinkable and beautifully done i really think the reserve maybe offers just another level of complexity maybe another level of intrigue we always talk about wine being emotional obviously we want to make sure you feel something and feel something positive but i also love sort of the intellectual sort of components of the wine where you go this wine's changing and there's so much more and oh i didn't get that nuance um I just love that wine i love that wine as well again just to go through it i know we're coming up to eight o'clock i don't want to waste your time any more than i have um the futures the the uh the cabernet futures will be available through midnight on monday the retail price is 34.95 for the cabernet franc it's 39.95 for the cabernet franc reserve and what that means is you can purchase the wine pre-hand you can also pick it up before it's really released officially but if you're a gold member you're just getting five percent over and above your discount again three bottles four and five you're just going to pay ten bucks but if you get six bucks uh, six bottles or more you're going to get free shipping if you're a silver member you're going to get 25 percent discounts and again if you're not a wine club member and i really wish you would be and we want you to be a part of this really incredible club in our family we still love you and you're going to give you 10 percent and uh the shipping sort of promos um um are applicable so let me go through uh one or two more let me see there's marianne uh Grablunas. 
Um, I love aged Virginia wines. We appreciate it. I know you're such a big proponent of Virginia and the wines. And again, Frank and everybody else who really sort of supports and, and talks about and preaches about Virginia wine. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, Margaret Sharon says, what a beautiful boy. I'd love to say he looks like me, but I really hope he looks like mama. And uh, if he does that and has mommy's heart and Aria's sort of character, he's going to be just fine. It's going to be just fine. Um, let's see what else there is. Um, golly, you know, one hour goes by so freaking quickly. And I think that means it's just we're having fun. We're learning something. Um, so let's, uh, let's finish it up. And again, what we need is a full glass of wine to, to finish up. What we got to do is take care of each other, take care of our families. Life's too short to drink bad wine, and hopefully that means Virginian. Tell people you love them, hug people, share your emotions, and first and foremost, be safe. You know, um, tough times in the world, you know, be safe out there. It is freaking hot. Uh, be safe, wear your mask, do whatever you got to do. Let's get through this thing so we can welcome you back to the winery. But Again, you know, from my family, you know, um, we say thank you. From our family, which is Keswick, which includes you. And if you're not part of the family, by being in the Barrel Club or the Wine Club, we want you to be. Um, we say thank you too. And uh, we really appreciate you. We appreciate the generosity. We appreciate you spending your time with us. We hope you learned something. We hope you enjoyed the wine. Uh, next week, we're talking about, we're, we're stepping it up even again. You know, the Merlot was phenomenal. The Cab Franc is a different level. We're talking about Cabernet Sauvignon next week, the 2017 and the 19. Big glasses, decant them at least an hour, serve them slightly chilled. We've got a lot to talk about. I am excited for you to get that 17 in the glass. Um, gosh, you know, just want to say thank you. We're blessed, we're grateful, we're happy, we're all good, and I hope the same can be said of you. So, um, I will see you in six days and 23 hours. I cannot wait. Have a great day. Um, make a difference in someone's life. We appreciate you. You guys are amazing. God bless you. Enjoy the wine. I know I'm going to, and uh, I will see you really, really, really soon.